Our guest today is Secretary of Transportation for the State of Illinois. He leads 10 offices that serve the transportation needs of Illinois across multiple modes, rural, suburban, and urban environments. He oversees a $3 billion operating budget and a $3 billion capital budget and su supports a workforce of 5,000 employees. He earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from Illinois State University. And his highest, uh, of, uh, the most meritorious thing, he reigns from McHenry, Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Blankenhorn. Randy. Thanks, Jay. I don't know if all of you know this, but uh, Jay and I are, are McHenry guys together. Our, our mothers used to play bridge together. Uh, and I want to offer my condolences on the passing of your dad, Don. Uh, he truly was Mr. McHenry, and he's made McHenry what it is today, so we will all miss him. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, it's an it's a interesting time of year. It's an interesting time in what's happening in state government. Uh, and I'm going to start with a few accomplishments, but I don't really want to dwell on that. I want to talk more about what we see happening, what the future looks like, and what we need to get done together. So uh, first I want to say that uh, we made a huge win about uh, six months ago, uh, getting $132 million in federal money for the 75th Street uh, Quarter Improvement Project. It is the backbone and the linchpin of the CREATE project. Uh, without that, we really can't fix the problems of Chicago. We really can't fix the problems of moving train traffic through this city uh, and through this region, and it's a huge win for us. But it was a big win for all of us. Uh, it took two years to put this deal together, uh, to get the railroads involved in the way that we needed them to, to invite Cook County to become a part of the Create Partners and bring not only money to the table, but their expertise as well and about a year to convince the feds that this was a worthy project that is truly of national significance. So we're incredibly proud of that. Uh, despite what we thought uh, four years ago, we actually finished mm -hmm. Chicago to St. Louis High Speed Rail, or I guess you could look at it as Joliet to Alton High Speed Rail. Uh, but that piece is done. And when we got here, honestly, we were troubled uh, that the deadlines of the federal government were strict. Uh, we really started to look at it in a different way. It was a kind of an all hands on deck issue. Uh, we brought our, our real estate people in from the highways that were used to buying land. We brought our engineers in from other parts of the department and uh, we got it done. Uh, we have new locomotives out there. I hope you've seen some of those. We have new rail cars in production uh, and that's a great thing. It will allow us to control our own destiny, to be able to, to manage our costs and to be able to provide passenger rail service in a better way to the people of Illinois and to the Midwest. Uh, we changed the way we think about investments. Uh, Illinois, not unlike most state DOTs, was what we would call a worst first agency. Mm -hmm. What's our worst problem out there? Let's go out there and fix it. And we didn't think about the life cycle of a project, what it costs to own a project from beginning to end. And we're really starting to think about it in that way. What can we do to make improvements midlife to make that life extend longer? How do we get better value for the taxpayer as we do that? Uh, we've also started to look at really what we've called downsizing. Uh, for 25 years, uh, people in my position and people at the Department of Transportation have been out uh, promising people new highways all over this state, most of which we will never build. Uh, and so we need to be serious about what we can and what we can't. Uh, we talk to coalitions and people that are interested in, in how their transportation system can be improved in their communities and said, what is the need we need to fix? What is the problem here? A four-lane highway doesn't fix all our problems. Let's try to fix the problems you have. And surprisingly, we've been relatively warmly embraced because we want to give people something and not keep talking about something that will never come. Uh, asset management is where we're going. We are going to manage our assets in ways that are different, both not only on the highway system, but across the agency, and think about what we do and how we do it differently and how we make better investments over time. A couple of weeks ago, we announced Autonomous Illinois. Our step into the automated vehicle world, uh, the connected vehicle world, it is time. I think I talked to all of you about this two or three years ago, that the future of transportation is changing 
and automated vehicles are a big part of that. Uh, we have some advantages. We have people that want to come and test here. We have great universities, great research institutions, great engineering firms that together we need to figure out what that future looks like and we need to again control some of that and not just let it happen to us. Uh, so this is the first step in that. It's a big step uh, and it really means that we want to be at the forefront of this change and not watching change happen all around us. For those of you in industry, I hope you noticed that we have been hiring. Uh, we have hired 1,500 people over the four years that we've been here. Uh, we've promoted another 1,200 people, which means half of our staff is doing a different job or is new to their job from four years ago. Uh, they do a great job. The IDOT staff are wonderful people. They're hard workers. Uh, they are innovative again, which is a key for us. They're trying to solve our problems, and they've gone through four years of tough times. Uh, so thank you to those of you that are here, and you should all thank them as well. This fall, our I-55 at Lakeshore Drive project was named AASHTO and U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Project of the Year. First time that's ever happened to us at the department. Uh, I tell people that I am most proud of the fact that we were nominated in the innovation category. Uh, the way we structured this project, the way we got in and out, the way we took two seasons instead of four, uh, really was a difference maker. Uh, not only for getting in and out of Chicago, but access to McCormick Place, access to Soldier Field, access to the lakefront. To be, to be able to move that more quickly, we're very proud of that. But that is one of dozens of awards that we've gotten over the years, uh, the last four years, and I think we're proud of that. We're saying that innovation is back. When I got here, I said we will once again be the most innovative DOT in the country, and if we're not, we're sure close. And I'm, I'm very proud of all the work that they've done there. But there's much to be done, much left unfinished, and there's a lot of work that we need to do together. Internally at IDOT, we have a human resources system that doesn't work. It's not designed to get the best people, it's designed to keep us out of court. Uh, we do not do things in the way that we can, we can attract young people, that we can keep young people, that we can promote young people, and we've got to find a way out of this. Uh, people have asked me when I came back to IDOT what were the things that shocked me the worst, and it is the bureaucracy. I'd forgotten about it. I'd forgotten how hard it is to get things done if you really want to in government, and this policy, these policies are part of that. I tell people all the time on our staff when they come to me with a personnel issue, and I say, only in government would that happen. Uh, we've got to get away from that. We've got to find new, smarter, better ways to attract, retain, and give people chances at the, at the Department of Transportation. We also need to change our procurement system. Uh, procurement is a problem across government, but it's particularly a problem in, at the state of Illinois. Yes, we had problems several years ago, and the pendulum swung so far that what we do with procurement is not a good deal for the taxpayer, and it doesn't promote and support our local economies. Uh, we've got to get back somewhere in the middle. I agree with that there has to be transparency. I agree there has to be accountability. Uh, but we're spending too much time, too much money, and too many barriers and silos and stovepipes in state government to make procurement work in any kind of an efficient way. We have to get approval from the General Assembly for public-private partnerships. Uh, we've spent three years plus working to get that done. Uh, it's something that needs to happen. It's not for most projects, but there are projects that it makes sense for. And we have to have the ability to deliver projects in new, better, more efficient ways, and P3s are one of them. I'm particularly disappointed that we never got the Stevenson Drive project. It's a project that everybody wanted. It was a project that would solve a big problem. And honestly, there was people would ask, what's wrong? Why isn't this happening? It is simply a political problem, and we have got to get the politics out of our transportation investments and our transportation decisions. <laughs> we also need to have more innovative project delivery options. We are one of a half a dozen states in this country that don't have design built. Uh, it's one of the things that we think, again, is for a small handful of projects, but when it works, it works. It delivers things faster, it delivers things cheaper. We worked for two years with industry to get consensus on what that would look like. We got that consensus, and we still couldn't get it done. So I hope that as we look to a new General Assembly, that we can get some of the policy issues back out in front of them, the things that are going to deliver transportation systems in a new way, and things that are going to make it easier for all of us to get done what we need to get done. 
Another thing where there is much, much, much to do is safety. For two years in a row, we've lost more than 1,000 people on our highways. 1,000 people is way too many. We're on track to not quite reach that number this year, and if our goal is 900, then we have the wrong goal. Uh, we've got to be thinking about safety in a totally different way. We've embedded safety in, across the department in our reorganization, trying to make it a part of the way that we think every day, and that will help. Uh, I created a task force with new people on it that aren't in our safety area to think about strategies differently. Our safety people are great, and they're used to doing things the way they're used to doing them, and we needed new thinking. Uh, and you're seeing some of that out there, I hope. Our dynamic message signs that are on our expressways, uh, I used to joke that the only thing they're good for is telling me how late I'm going to be. Uh, you know, now, as you look at that, we were alternating between the creative and the stark realities of how many people are dying out there. Uh, even uh, the two columnists that probably dislike me the most wrote nice articles about what we're doing. And just this morning, uh, I approved, uh, I, I selected, we had a public contest with more than 1,000 entries on what we should put on our message signs, and I selected those this morning. So look forward to seeing some interesting and new and fun and educational message signs out there coming in the next few weeks. Uh, we held a summit. It's not an IDOT problem. Safety is not just an IDOT problem. We brought in local governments, emergency responders, state police and local police officials to talk about how are we going to do this together. What is the real problem that we're trying to solve here and how do we, how do we make that happen? I am firmly convinced that most of our in increase in, in fatalities on our roadway is due to distracted driving. Uh, I drive back and forth to Springfield every week. I spend a lot of time in the car and people are on their phones constantly. I probably told you this before, uh, but when I drive by and I see them on the phone, I'll, I'll honk my horn and I'll go like this and they'll flip me off. Uh, you know, they don't realize it's a problem. They don't realize that this is an issue that has to be dealt with and we have to find a way to do that. And this summit was designed to start a new discussion about real solutions, about solving the problem, about getting to zero. We're going to create a problem called Toward Zero Deaths. Uh, and as we, Minnesota has something very similar, they came and talked to us about it. And I said, is zero really the number? Is zero reality? Can we ever get to zero? And as we went through that conversation, I realized that zero is the number. Zero fatalities is the number. Because if it's not zero, under what circumstances is it all right for somebody to die? Under what circumstances is it all right that we have fatal crashes? And the answer is there should be none. These aren't statistics. They're mothers and fathers, sons and daughters that aren't coming home. And we've got to start thinking about that. And we've got to start thinking about it in a new way. The final thing, at least for now, uh, that I want to talk about that we haven't done is what you all know and we have not come close to addressing our funding issues. Uh, we need to do that now. We're losing ground every single day. We have roadway problems, we have bridge problems, we have transit problems, we have rail problems. All of this needs to be addressed in a way that is multimodal, that is big, and that solves our problems and doesn't keep pushing problems down the road. While I'm concerned about our roadways, I'm really concerned about our bridges. We have almost 8,000 bridges on the state system, thousands more on our local system. If I just talk about the major bridges, our bridges over rivers, our 1,000-foot-plus-long bridges, we have 237 of them. Three-quarters were built before 1980. More than half are more than 50 years old. 15% are 75 years old. If, we want, if our goal was to keep all of our bridges over under 75 years, all our major bridges, we'd have to be replacing a, five bridges a year for the next 30 years. Right now, we're replacing less than one. That's a problem, and it's a problem that we have to address and we have to figure out. It's not just a state system, it's a local system. I tell people all the time that a bridge falls in, nobody cares if it's a local road or a state highway. It's a dangerous situation and we've got to get out of it. Our bridges are safe. We're not saying that they're not. We're out there inspecting them constantly to make sure they are. But getting old and that age is going to catch up to us and we're going to have to do something about it soon. Hundreds of miles of new roadways become less than good every year. Much more than that on the local system. We have no ability, no resources to modernize, no resources to add capacity, no resources to do the things that truly provide economic opportunity, that provide the mobility, to provide the access to jobs, provide the opportunity for this economy to grow across the state 
and we've got to find a way to invest in that. It's very possible, and this is something none of you are going to want to hear, but it's very possible as we, pre as we prepare our next multi-year highway program that at the end years of that program we will not be able to, to match federal funds. That we will leave federal funds on the table because we don't have enough road fund cash to match it. That's a problem that's coming, it's coming soon, and it's a problem that we have to deal with. We have to get serious about this problem. We've been talking around it for too, too long. It's time to get serious. You know that I'm a user fee guy. I believe in user fees. I believe that users pay. I believe it's the fairest system that we have, and I believe it's one that we can implement and continue to implement uh, instantly. You know, marijuana and gambling, they sound nice. Uh, we got to stop looking at the pretty balls, you know. <laughs> That's not the way to fund transportation. That's not what we should be counting on to invest in our infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, now I see on TV, I'm watching the Bears game, and we got pizza companies that want to that wanna fix our potholes. You know? <laughs> That's embarrassing to me. Uh, and it ought to be embarrassing to all of us. It's a great marketing tool, uh, but the fact is that our roads are bad enough the pizza companies are advertising that we'll come and fix your potholes for you because the people that are supposed to do it can't. Uh, that's a problem and it's a problem that we're going to have to deal with. The lockbox, uh, the lockbox is going to do some things that are really going to help the future. They're going to protect future revenues, but in, the, in all honesty, in the short term, it was a distraction. It didn't solve today's problems. Uh, I will tell you that after uh, it was passed, my boss and many legislators came to me and said, okay, how much new money is there? And I had to tell them that there wasn't any. There was no money. No, no money. It was about protecting the funds we have, it was about protecting future funds, but it distracted us from solving the problem, which is that we need new revenue. So let's get the, forget the shiny balls, and let's get back to basics. Right now, the average motorist in Illinois spends $15 a month on their gas, state gas taxes and state registration fees. $15 a month, 50 cents a day. I pay $250 a month for my cell phone. Now, my kids are a big part of that, and they still won't call me back. Uh, but I pay $250 for my cell phone. I pay $50 for my internet. I pay $30 for my water. This is the infrastructure of my life. This is what makes my life work. And yet, we spend 50 cents a day for a transportation system that, is, that drives the economy of Illinois. 50 cents a day to get you to work, to get your children to school, to get your groceries to the grocery store. It's insufficient, and we need to do something about it. We need to raise the gas tax. We need to raise the gas tax, and we need to index it. We need to raise registration fees, both on trucks and on cars. We need to raise fees on electric vehicles and hybrids to make sure they're paying their fair share. Not more than their fair share, but their fair share. We need to transfer the sales tax on gasoline to, the, to transportation funding and away from the general revenue fund. Honestly, I think it's a lockbox violation and it's going to happen eventually anyway, but we might as well get out in front of it and put the transportation money where it should be, and that's into transportation projects. We need to broaden sales tax uh, base in Illinois to include services. Not all services, but services that our neighbors tax. Wisconsin, Indiana, Iowa, all tax certain services, and you know what? If I play golf in Wisconsin and I pay eight, you know, eight dollars more for it because of a tax, I don't not play. Uh, it's not going to drive business away. And the fact is that services is the growing part of the economy, not goods. And if we're going to take advantage of that, we need to think about how we broaden that sales tax in a way that's fair, in a way that's equal to our surrounding states. And this is going to provide significant funding for the RTA if we use the formulas that we have today that can provide better transit access, better transit capital, better transit operating, and move people around the city and around this region in a better way. We need to expand the use of tolling. Tolling is not for every project, but there are projects out there where tolling makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have a study, Bob and I do, with, with CMAP, that is looking at the future of the expressway system. And part of that is where do tolls make sense? And how do they make sense? And Bob and I have said, we don't care right now in this discussion about whose project it is. Does the tollway do it? Does it IDOT do it? We need to think of this together, and that's what we're doing. But there are opportunities where it makes financial sense, where it makes sense to, as, as, a tra as a transportation system, and we need to be looking at those opportunities. Some of these new revenues need to go to pay as you go for transit, for rail, for bikes and peds, for airports, 
places where we are fighting general revenue all the time, and that's not a place we want our transportation system to be. We want dedicated funds, not just for highways, but for all of our transportation programs that is able to give us continuity, consistency, and thinking about where we can spend money and enough money to get the job done. Finally on this, I think that although many people don't like it, we got to start to think about a pilot program for a mileage-based tax system. The gas tax is not sustainable in the midterm, much less the long term. Uh, I don't think we need another study. I think it's been studied to death. I think we need to find communities that are tech savvy and interested and try it and see what works and see what doesn't and learn from what works in Illinois. We're not Oregon. We're not California. We think differently, but it is where we're going to have to go in some way in the not too distant future. So let's figure it out. Let's try something and let's see what works. So last week, I sent an a email to my staff uh, telling them that I would be leaving at the end of the year. And I got a lot of nice notes back. Uh, and there was, there was really a common theme in it. And the common theme was, thanks for trying. You know? <laughs> and I thought to myself, when did trying become enough? When did just trying become where we set our bar? Uh, it truly is a problem that we've gotten where government is, it is a point where no one feels like we can get anything done, and that has to change. Uh, we need to think about trying, and we need to think about differently about doing. Honestly, I'm tired of trying. I'm tired of talking. I want to do. And I think that's where we're at with our transportation investment system, is it's time to quit trying, <laughs> time to quit talking, time to do. It's time for action because either we believe that transportation is Illinois' global economic advantage or we don't. Either we believe that transportation is a necessary component of a strong community or we don't. Either we believe that transportation that works is vitally important to our residents' lives or we don't. And if we do, then the time is now to invest. Invest in a way that is sustainable. Invest in a way that, 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 create, that takes care of our problems over the long term, not just over the next four years, five years, or ten years, but thinks about it over that long term. We need to find a way to make it big enough to solve our problems. I'm tired of Band-Aids on head wounds. It's time to be serious about this and do something that makes sense. And if we don't think those things are important, then it's time that we make that conscious decision and we're honest about it. We're honest about the consequences of not investing the consequences to business, the consequences to communities, the consequences to our residents, the consequences to our neighborhoods, and we need to be upfront that this just isn't a priority for us. So we need to decide, and the time is now. The opportunity is today. We have a new governor, we have a new general assembly. I wish both of them and all of them well and the best, but this is the time for us to get serious. This is the time for us to quit talking, to quit trying, and to take action and get something done. If we miss this opportunity, I'm not sure when it comes again. So to all of you, we need to work together. We need to continue to fight for what we think is the right thing for our system, the right thing for our residents, the right thing for our businesses, the right thing for transportation, and we need to do it now. So thank you very much for having me today, uh, and I look forward to continuing this relationship over the years. Jay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And now we can handle questions. If anybody has a question that they would like to ask of uh, Randy, fill out your blue form, write it down, make it legible, and our staff will come around and collect it, and we'll handle your questions. The very first one is from Jack Hartman with SDI. Uh, I'm not taken from consultants. <laughs> Randy, if that's the case, almost everybody's going to leave the room here. <laughs> okay. Um, how can you clean up the graffiti that has been on the Kennedy Express, Kennedy, Eisenhower, and Stevenson for months? 
It is the worst I have seen in decades. It ruins the image of Chicagoland. Well, thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. <laughs> At least we know he's on the different expressways. Yeah. It, it is a serious problem. Not, not just graffiti, but trash along our expressways is continuing to be a problem. Uh, we get there, and, and you know, I, we say this and people don't believe it. Uh, we get there and clean it off, and next week it's back. Uh, you know, we need to do better work with, with law enforcement that can make sure that's not happening. Uh, we need to do maybe a better PR type of campaign, uh, particularly on the littering side, to make sure that people aren't. Uh, yeah, it's unattractive. It makes, uh, you know, it makes our expressways and, in many cases, our entrances into the city look awful, and that's not, the, that's not what we want to have happen out there. So uh, we are, as you know, while we're hiring, we still don't have as many people we would like, and our highway maintainers right now are honestly out there keeping the roadways fixed, uh, so we don't have as much time as we used to. But it's not a problem we can ignore. It's, it's a problem that we've got to find a different way to deal with. Okay. Um, Randy, if, oh, very good. That's my own question. Good. <laughs> this is from Randy Blankenhorn to Randy Blankenhorn. <clears throat> it's actually from City Club member Tom Koterek, who's with the Civic Community of the Commercial Club of Chicago. What are the most important changes in transportation policy and law the General Assembly should make if they raise new money for transportation? So I, I, think, I think number one is, Tom, you know, I, I'm not for new money without policy that makes us make better investments. Uh, we've done a, a, a reasonably good job in implementing a new system of how we make investment decisions, uh, performance-based programming, we call it, based on real criteria, real statistics, uh, and we need to continue that and maybe to a certain degree, we should codify that. Uh, not to the extent that it ties our hands, uh, but to the extent that we say to the, to the public, the General Assembly is willing to give IDOT more money, but we want to make sure that it's spent wisely. And I think that's, that's one thing. Secondly, they have to give us the delivery methods that we need. They have to give us P3. They have to give us design build. To me, as I said, once now that the, the election is over, maybe we can get, get back to that and those real issues. I think that has to happen too. I think the third is we've got to make sure that we're not just developing a highway capital bill. Uh, this has to be a multimodal capital bill that solves all of our problems across the state and across the region. Uh, if we leave one behind, we will not have a system that works. So uh, I'm, I'm always concerned about making sure uh, that our transit partners, our rare partners, aren't just the tail that's, that's on the dog, that it needs to be wagging that dog a little bit. Uh, and so I think those are the kind of the key, key things that I think we've got to think about as we move into hopefully a new revenue bill. Okay, Randy, with the <clears throat> new governor coming in and uh, the legislature all being part of the same uh, political party, do you anticipate that it will be easier to develop this broad-based transportation policy than it has been in the past four years with the budget problems, the infighting, um, some would say the lack of strong leadership from the executive and so on? So I, w I would hope so. Uh, I think this, as I said, I think this is the opportunity. I think this is the time. Uh, you know, we'll see. How, you know, honestly, the big question is, as the Pritzker administration comes in, they got a lot of problems that they have to deal with. The state has a lot of problems that we need to deal with. And where does transportation fit in that problem solving? Uh, is it something that they want to get to quickly, which I think they need to do, uh, or you know, there are still budget deficits, there are still education issues, there are still other problems that they need to deal with. Where does that fit on the priority list, I think is really going to tell on what gets done and how fast. Uh, you know, having everybody in one party sometimes works well, and we've seen other times here in Illinois where it was not all that successful. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the key. But I think it's the opportunity. Now is the opportunity, and we've got to take advantage of that. Curious, have uh, anybody from the Pritzker transition team uh, talked with you yet, or do you anticipate meeting with them in the coming weeks? You said you'd be leaving by the end of the year. So that's only like a, a month away. 
So no, I have, I have not had any conversations. Uh, for those of you that have connections, I am happy to talk to them at their convenience. Uh, as, as you all know, I'm not shy with ideas. Uh, but I, I do think that it, it's important that whether it's me or someone else in our, in, our, in our department, have a conversation about where we are, what's happening, the things that are going well and the things that are not going well, and try to prep them. I mean, we need someone that's going to be able to come in and hit the ground running because we've got issues we've got to fail, deal with tomorrow. So the question I have here, this is from uh, <clears throat> our staffer, Alex Hawley. Um, he says, you've had a distinguished career for more than two decades at CMAP and now um, with the Department of Transportation. Can you give us any clues as to what may be next for you? <laughs> Honestly, I wish I could. Uh, I have, uh, I had told myself and others that until the election was over, I wasn't going to think about it at all, and I didn't. Uh, I have started, but uh, I don't have plans, and honestly, that's a little scary uh, of, of putting, being in my job and my jobs for the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, to not know exactly what tomorrow brings is interesting and fun and challenging, and we'll see where it goes. So thanks. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions. Is there anybody, last chance? to ask a question of the current Secretary of Transportation. Great. By the way, he's not one to shrink from any issues, is he? Because he really threw out some very direct and bold challenges today. And let's give him a big round of applause for that.